Welcome, everyone. We are just going to give it a minute before we get started at the top of the hour, which is just coming up around. All right, it is two o'clock and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Pat McCone. I am a senior director with the American Lung Association. Next slide, please. Uh, there we are. Uh, so I want to thank you for taking time this afternoon for this webinar celebrating Native American Heritage Month. And for our opening comments, I'm delighted to hand this over to our national president and CEO, Harold Wimmer. Well, thank you, Pat. And hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us for the American Lung Association's webinar, Traditional Verse Commercial Tobacco from a Native Lens. The American Lung Association has a long standing history of health promotion and advocacy work to reduce health disparities, both raising awareness of disparities and also taking action to address them. In our work to prevent lung disease and improve lung health, we want to reach all people in the United States, but especially those who bear a disproportionate burden of health inequities. As you know, Today's webinar will focus on the difference between traditional tobacco used for medicinal, sacred, or ceremonial purposes versus commercial tobacco, such as cigarettes manufactured and sold to addict people to harmful ingredients that cause disease and death. Our esteemed presenter, Melissa Dowd, will discuss this distinction and also the importance of understanding these differences when supporting commercial tobacco prevention efforts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this webinar is a part of a series of events and resources that we're highlighting in honor of Native American Heritage Month. The month of November is a time for us to celebrate the significant contributions Native peoples have made and inspire meaningful action to continue to address lung health in an equity-centered way. In collaboration with our National Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council, in addition to this webinar, we have several special features focused on tribal communities on our website that we encourage you to explore at lung.org diversity. Now, I'd like to turn it over to our National Senior Manager of Tobacco Programs, Rebecca Padilla, to share some new resources. Rebecca? Thank you, Harold. I'm excited today to announce that the Lung Association is helping to educate and build confidence among public health professionals and community-based individuals who are addressing commercial tobacco disparities in indigenous communities. To that end, today I'm proud to announce the release of the next iteration of our health equity series, Addressing Commercial Tobacco Use in Indigenous Communities Toolkit. The purpose of this toolkit is to examine issues related to commercial tobacco use and nicotine dependence in indigenous communities and to provide culturally competent strategies, tools, and lessons learned that can be implemented by public health professionals, clinicians, and community partners serving diverse indigenous communities. This toolkit presents a model that honors the vision of decolonizing tobacco among indigenous people 
as a path to fostering wellness and achieving health equity among indigenous communities. Collective action rooted in cultural humility can create the achievable and sustainable change required to address nicotine use and addiction in today's indigenous communities. The Lung Association and its consulting partners and experts in the field have opted to use the language of indigenous communities for this public health toolkit. The term is considered or is intended to be inclusive of the diverse multitude of communities and peoples, including but not limited to those people who identify as Alaska Native, American Indian, Native American, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander, as well as those who may or may not be uh, state or fed federally recognized indigenous communities or sovereign nations. The first version of this toolkit is primarily focused on success, success stories in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. The American Lung Association is intending to create future iterations and addendums to this toolkit as funding allows. Throughout this toolkit, we explore some basic assumptions, some key concepts, and methodologies to unite public health professionals in a shared understanding of the issues that Indigenous people face as they work to improve health in their communities. This toolkit also includes success stories that demonstrate the practical aspects of reclaiming wellness through unified efforts to decolonize tobacco. These stories are meant to inspire you and your work to support the Indigenous communities that you serve. The American Lung Association would like to take a moment to quickly thank those external national partnering organizations listed here who've engaged in this project and provided subject matter expertise and review, including the authoring agency, CARES Consulting, programming best practice contributors, as well as content review com committee entities. So this toolkit is being released today, November 29th, and provides information and resources on the following, including health equity and why it matters in indigenous communities, understanding the impact of historical trauma and cultural values, customs, and languages, the impact of commercial tobacco and nicotine dependence on behavioral health, and the use of data and data sovereignty in indigenous communities. Along with this, we discuss big tobacco industry marketing tactics, best practices, and we hope to inspire you with success stories and provide you with lots of great resources. So I would love to invite everyone joining us today or on future webcasts to take a look at this new toolkit by scanning the QR code on the screen, or you can visit lung.org and search for Indigenous Communities Toolkit. We encourage you to share this toolkit across coalition lists, listservs, and with your internal and external partners. And it's uh, complete available professional development trainings. We also would encourage you to identify key community champions that you work with. And finally, we would like to ask for you to download and customize resources that are available in the toolkit. And you can even include imagery from your community via a quick request form to American Lung. Finally, another way you can take action is to facilitate commercial tobacco cessation programming using those counseling guidelines and proven effective strategies detailed in the toolkit. So on behalf of the entire Lung Association and partners engaged in this project, we wanna thank you for your support and interest in helping us create a commercial tobacco-free future. I want to turn things back over to Pat McCone to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Pat? Thanks, Rebecca. <clears throat> and great that the um, toolkit is being released today. Thank you for that information. Just a couple housekeeping uh, uh, reminders. We are being recorded. So if you think Alexa is listening, Alexa is recording. So we are recording this webinar. And we also are using the Q&A part of the uh, Zoom mode for your questions. And we will have a Q&A time. But please put any questions that come up along the way uh, in that Q&A box. So it's my pleasure to actually introduce Melissa Dowd. Uh, Melissa is a proud member of the Lac de Flambeau Bo Bo Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians in northern Wisconsin, where we're both situated today in the path of a beautiful snow that's coming down. 
She's a 20 year Army veteran and thank you so much for your service, Melissa, and has been to various duty stations around the world to include a tour in Iraq. She earned her bachelor's degree in business management. Her workplaces include the United States Army, the Chippewa Valley Bank, the Lac de Flambeau Business Development Corporation and Great Lakes Intertribal Council or GLITSI. Melissa has been the program director for the Wisconsin Native American Tobacco Network. We do love acronyms, don't we, Melissa? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and Glitzy since November of 2020, where the mission is to enhance the quality of life for all Native people. She successfully has built a network of seven Native uh, representatives from various tribes in Wisconsin through her leadership and her engagement and her welcoming personality, I must say. Along with representatives from each tribe, the collective group focuses on educating informing and providing the resources to Native communities about traditional tobacco versus commercial tobacco. Melissa is very passionate about the work she's doing with commercial tobacco prevention and control, and she's brought a new perspective through teaching and sharing vision through a Native lens. She has five children, one grandson, and a granddaughter on the way. Woohoo, Melissa. <clears throat> and she enjoys dancing at powwows, practicing her culture, hunting, fishing, hiking, traveling, and sewing. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing your knowledge and expertise and your passion with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Miigwech, as we say in my language. Um, very, very glad to be here and uh, such a warm, welcoming invite. So I just want to say say that um i'm going to start off in my native language that is uh tradition or you know just common practice in native country so i will start off by saying uh buju animikikwe and indigenous cause was swagging and doing jaba makon and do them um ajay mani do go dap nana say man gapinagad gake go in a shinabe o man go dap na minwa say ma gaka he go bimo say what in a shinabe a king and when I said there was just hello, my name is Melissa Dowd. My Ojibwe name is Thunder Woman. And I'm from the Lac de Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians, and I'm Bear Clan. I asked the Creator to, to bless us today and offer tobacco for all who are gathered here. And we offer tobacco for every living thing that walks this earth. And just want to think about those that maybe couldn't be here, uh, those that are maybe having, having a tough time um, in their lives. And we just want to kind of just think about people in that way in, in a good way and um yeah so i'll just say about about that much um and we'll go on to the next slide so we'll do a little bit of of housekeeping i just kind of like want to start off things in a very very good way i just respectfully ask you to just um just stay engaged and it is okay in the space to experience discomfort it's totally understandable. I'm probably going to share some stories that will, um, they're hard truths. And uh, so as the next bullet is speak your truth, I will be doing that today. <laughs> and you can expect or, or and, and accept non-closure. There may be things that, you know, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. It may be some, this is a learning journey for all of us. So um, it's, uh, it's okay if we don't have all the answers, but we learn and grow. Um, by finding those together and so what's said here stays here and what's learned here leaves here so those are just some basic little housekeeping rules that i like to go over with um next slide please um so some of our objectives today uh i want to share with you the knowledge of wisconsin tribes and um a little bit of my history only from lack of flambeau um and have you understand sovereignty and how that shows up in public work um, to learn the differences between traditional and commercial tobacco and learn the best practices for building those tribal partnerships. Next slide, please. OK, this is going to be fun. OK, um, for those that have not had my training, um, I would like for you to just put one or two words in the chat of what you think about the First thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word tobacco. Yeah. 
Okay, I see bad. Industry, bad breath, smoke, addicting, lung cancer, cancer, money, addiction, smoke, illness, smell. Okay. Okay, there's a whole bunch of um, whole bunch of words in there. Now I'm going to share my words. So if everyone could just stop and pay attention to the chat, I'm going to put the words that I think of when I hear the word tobacco. So that's the whole point of today is to kind of get you to understand understand a native perspective. So when I hear the word tobacco, I think traditional and that it's sacred and it is an offering and we use it in prayer. And that is the difference between the commercial, which is harmful and gets you addicted versus our traditional tobacco that we as Native Americans hold very, very sacred to us. Next slide, please. So this picture depicts the lands of the Native Americans in Wisconsin. For non-Indigenous communities, land acknowledgement is a powerful way of showing respect and honoring Indigenous peoples of this land on which we work, live, and play. Acknowledgement is a simple way of resisting the erasure of our Indigenous histories and working towards honoring and inviting truth. My tribal history is, tells the story of Turtle Island of North America. And there's a legend and story that goes with that that I will share with you in a moment. So please take a look at this map if you are in Wisconsin. Um, uh, you can look and see where you live and play. Um, sorry, I'm, my link isn't sharing. Um, I wanted to share the uh, the link where you can do the, the land acknowledgement and I'll just share that um, at another time or after the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, this is a list of the tribes in Wisconsin. We have six Ojibwe bands and then there's other individual tribes listed on there. And then we also have um, Brotherton, um, which is not fairly recognized, but we do acknowledge them. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a fun part. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell a story of Turtle Island. Um, to understand Ojibwe people, one must understand that our legends are sacred and they form a basis of our spiritual beliefs. We have a primarily oral culture where our legends have been passed down through the telling of stories. We refer to ourselves as Anishinaabe, which means original people. One legend is the creation of Turtle Island which represents North America. And we, are, we see ourselves as the original people of North America. And the legend is as follows. Long ago, after the great spirit Gichumanadu created mankind, the Anishinaabe began to fight amongst themselves. Gone were the people's harmonious ways. Seeing that the people had lost their peaceful ways, Gichimanadu decided to cleanse the earth by bringing about a flood that drowned the Anishinaabe people and most of the animals. The only person to survive the flood was Winnebuju, who was a trickster, and a few of the animals that could swim or fly. Winnebuju floated on a log and searched for land, but none could be found. Winnebuju allowed the remaining animals to take turns resting on the log. And Winnebuju said, I am going to dive to the bottom of this water and grab a handful of earth. And with this earth, we can make a new land on which to live. Winnebuju dived into the water and disappeared for a long time. The animals waited. They thought that he had drowned. Finally, Winnebuju surfaced, gasping for air and muttered, the water is too deep for me to reach the bottom. Then Mang, or the loon, spoke. I can dive deep into the water. That is how I catch my food. 
I will try to make it and return with some earth in my beak. Luan dove into the water and after a long while returned to the surface, weakened and out of breath and said, I could not make it. There must be no bottom to this water. Other animals tried. Jingbezis, the hell diver, Jungwesh, the mink, and Mijike, the turtle, but to no avail. The other animals tried too, but no one succeeded. Then a soft, muffled voice was heard to say, I'll try. To everyone's astonishment, they looked to see who had just spoken. And it was Wajashk, the muskrat. Again, he repeated, I can do it. Some of the animals mocked the little muskrat. And when Abuju reminded everyone that only Gichimanadu can place judgment on others, Wajashk, the muskrat, must be given the opportunity to tribute. Off into the water he went, and he stayed underwater for what was the longest time. Feeling exhausted, with his lungs screaming for air, he grabbed some earth in his paw and used all his remaining might and strength to return to the surface. Everyone was waiting. Finally, the muskrat's body floated to the surface, and when Abuju pulled the motionless body onto the log, brothers and sisters, said Winnebuju. Muskrat went too long without air, and he is now in the spirit world. The muskrat's paw was clenched tightly. Winnebuju carefully opened the small paw and exclaimed in amazement, Look, there is a small ball of earth in muskrat's paw. Muskrat sacrificed his life so that life on earth could begin anew. The animals were grateful and rejoiced. Winnebuju took the ball of earth and the turtle swam forward and said, I will use my back to bear the weight of this piece of earth. With the help of Gichimanadu, we can make a new place to live. Winnebuju put the small piece of earth on the turtle's back and the winds started blowing from the four directions and the tiny ball of earth started to grow and grow until it formed a minisi or island in the water. The island grew larger and heavier, but still the turtle bore the weight of this earth on his back. When Abuja and all the animals danced and sang songs of praise on this growing island, after a while, the four winds ceased to blow and the water became still. A huge island sat in the middle of the water and that island today is known to us as North America. We hold special respect for the muskrat and turtle who sacrificed their lives so that the people could have a second chance. To this day, the muskrats do their part too in remembering the great flood. And that is why they still build their lodges in the shape of little balls of earth. So that's the story of Turtle Island. Next slide, please. So whose land do you occupy? I think this is the link I was trying to share a moment ago. Uh, these are the lands of the original people. Take a moment to identify the lands on which you dwell. As we become more aware of exclusivity in the workplace, it is important that we pay respect to others such as using pronouns as common practice. If you're trying to think of something that you can do this month and from here on out, you could show respect to Indigenous people by simply adding a land acknowledgement in your email signature block. It is a simple way, but also a very powerful way to show respect. Next slide, please. So I'm going to tell you the little story about Lac de Flambeau. So Lac du Flambeau means Lake of Flames. And so many, many moons ago when the uh, when the fur traders first started coming here um, at nighttime, they could see these little balls of fire on the water. And they were curious about that, wondering what what was that? What does that mean? What are, what's going on? How is there fire on this water? And so you'll see in this picture that many, many moons ago, um, we used to make birch bark canoes and have the fire pots on the end. And what that did with the fish, the walleye during spawning season was it made their eyes glow 
and it was easier for us to spear the fish and that's what we still do to this day as, as harvesting and yes that's a picture of me i do practice our our treaties and our cultural rights so that's just a little history on lac de flambeau and so our band had inhabited lac de flambeau since um 1840 or 1745 when chief kishkaman led our band to this area our tribe has a seven clan system and each clan has roles, talents and responsibilities to contribute to the overall well-being of the entire nation. There are seven primary clans of the Anishinaabe people, loon, crane, fish, bird, bear, marten and deer. And many moons ago, Kishkaman had told us um, when we were kind of moving to go where the food grows on water. And what that meant was we finally settled where um, the wild rice beds are and we still practice our wild ricing to this day. We don't bite in that Uncle Ben stuff. We harvest it around uh, September and it's a long like seven to nine step process to to harvest and um, prepare wild rice. And so um, you'll see that in this picture too that of course we have we've um, we've adapted and migrated and things change over time so we don't necessarily have the fire pots on the end of birch bark canoes but we have the headlamps and the and that's how we kind of spear our fish and gather. So next slide, please. This is some harsh images that you'll see here. And so this era and time was known as the walleye wars. Um, it became the name for the late 20th century events in Wisconsin in protest of Ojibwe hunting fishing rights. In a 1975 case, the tribes challenged state efforts to regulate their hunting and fishing off the reservations and to practice those rights in ceded territories based on the rights and the treaties of St. Peter's and La Pointe. Treaties are binding agreements between nations and become part of law. Hundreds of protesters lined boat landings to make their case that tribal members enjoyed special rights. They shouted offensive slogans, sometimes through rocks and even at the natives who were spearing and even protecting officials to disrupt the spearing protesters launched boats and circled our harvesters at high speed trying to knock us out of the boats we have been shot at we have been uh, degraded and you can see by some of these harsh signs that uh, unfortunately some of this still exists to this day um, and even though the violence has receded it has not disappeared. In 2020, just recently, an intoxicated man fired a gun toward an LDF tribal member, and it resulted only in a misdemeanor as he claimed he was shooting at a squirrel. Incidents like this are often diminished. But what most, a lot of people do not know is that through our tribal fish hatcheries, we put more fish into the lakes than we take. So it's a huge, misunderstanding and I think a lot is to be learned from the walleye wars. Next slide please. The Sandy Lake tragedy was essentially a Chippewa Trail of Tears back in 1850 when the attempted forced removal of Ojibwe Indians from Upper Michigan and Wisconsin were sent to Sandy Lake, Minnesota to collect their annuity payments leading to the deaths of some 400 Ojibwe men, women and children the event that went long without commemoration. For 150 years, it was forgotten by many and is still not something widely discussed or known about today. 12% of men, women, and children died during that time. This is why natives are so cautious. There is a history of genocide. Since the arrival of the first ship to the new world, native populations have had a hard go at survival and maintaining our way of life. We've combated disease, the European, other tribes, settlers, and the government. We have sold land to the government in an attempt to maintain our culture and way of life. But we've pressed on through death, caused to our cultures and tribal structures. The Ojibwe history is one that is told, but often with blinders on. Next slide, please. Pictured here, you will see the Lac de Flambeau Boys Dormitory, it's boarding school. 
During the 19th century, the United States government created multiple policies to assimilate Native Americans into the culture of European American culture. One of these waves was to create boarding houses for Native American children. Mandatory attendance was required for children ages 5 to 15. The government-run year-round boarding school at Lac de Flambeau was opened in 1895 and was shifted to a day school in 1932. Most of the children at Lac de Flambeau were Ojibwe. Native children were ripped from their families and Christianity was forced upon them. One in four children died during the boarding school era. Data shows that 50 to 75% would not reach adulthood or even um, after being returned to their families. There's an entire generation of lost children. The Ojibwe language was beaten out of us. My great grandmother went to this boarding school and told me of days when she and others were punished for speaking our native tongue. This resulted in historical trauma that is still embedded within us today. This form of genocide has caused mistrust, fear, and hesitancy in developing relationships with non-natives. We have prevailed and we are still here. Lac de Flambeau has revitalized this once eyesore and harsh reminder of dark days into our historical preservation office. Our Ojibwe language is being revitalized and native crafts such as birch bark basket making, tanning hides from hunting and moccasin making and beading to name a few are now being taught on a regular basis. What once was supposed to abolish us is now a place where we flourish. We are a prosperous and resilient people. Next slide, please. Pictured here, you'll see a recent picture of a high school teacher at Wausau West High School teaching Native history. The photo was taken by a Native American student who was appalled at what he was seeing in front of him. He took the picture, told his dad, and there was an uproar in Native communities of Wisconsin. WIEA, Wisconsin Indian Education Association, was contacted and the school was approached by the boy's father, Native leaders, and other concerned individuals about this incident. His teacher had been teaching like this for 16 years and had never been corrected because there was never a Native student in his class. This behavior is inappropriate and disrespectful for a non-Native to play Indian. Who better to teach Native history than a Native American with experiences and knowledge versus books written by non-Natives teaching Peter Pan curriculum? Just this past Halloween, there was an LDF tribal member who went trick-or-treating in Rhinelander. One of our adults saw a Girl Scout leader dressed up as an Indian with feathers and war paint. Inappropriate and disrespectful. Our culture is not a costume. Next slide, please. Oh, it just gets better and better. In, in 2020, CNN referred to us during the election polls as something else. And it sparked backlash. Just last week or a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a, some on Native American Heritage Month, there was a commentator on ABC and the reporter misspoke and referred to us as indigenous creatures. For outsiders looking in, that misuse of words might seem hard, like a harmless mistake, but for indigenous people, it's a reminder of the mistrust and broken relationships. This type of language continues um, the efforts to erase indigenous and others who don't neatly fall into the race categories or that graphic. So I know it's been kind of tough. These are just some harsh, harsh truth, and uh, it may be hard to hear. So let's let's navigate and fast forward onto some great things that we're doing in Indian country. Next slide, please. Dun, dun, dun. Here is Winnaton, Wisconsin Native American Tobacco Network. Um, so what you'll see here is all the various tribes of Wisconsin. Uh, Winnaton is um, funded by the TPCP, Tobacco Prevention Control Program of Wisconsin, and is housed under Great Lakes Intertribal Council in, in Lac de Flambeau. 
Um, along with representatives from each tribe, the collective group focuses on educating, informing, and providing the resources to Native communities about traditional tobacco versus commercial tobacco because Native communities have long been targeted by the big tobacco companies. Navigating our efforts has been a little challenging over the last two years, but collectively we've gotten um, message delivery and communications um, on a great path as we strive toward a commercial tobacco free environment. And next slide please. So I'm going to give you a little brief, brief history on tobacco. When I talked about the boarding school days, um, and in the very beginning, I mentioned that traditional tobacco is very, very sacred to us. We use it in, in various ceremonies. We use it if we harvest an animal. We offer tobacco for everything. It always comes first. It is very, very sacred to us, and that was taken from us. It was taken, just as like our language. It was trying, they were trying to kill the Indian and save the man. So we're starting to revitalize um, some of that. And um, I like to think, and I use the words of a colleague of mine, Lori Dubrest, who had shared, she said, this tobacco is very, very sacred. It is a live breathing thing. It knows what it's doing. Tobacco brought us here today. Tobacco brought us here today. We need to be careful how we talk about it because this plant was taken you know what we do is remove the all the chemicals out of it and then and if it's smoked it's not inhaled it's just to carry prayers and so we want to just be careful on how we talk about it because it's not the plant's fault that it was filled with all those chemicals it's not the plant's fault that it was tarnished in a bad way so that's a little bit of that, that history and context that I wanted to share. Next slide, please. So pictured here, you also see like the tobacco plants. There's a Native American pipe where traditional tobacco is smoked but not inhaled. The smoke from the traditional tobacco is believed to carry prayers up to our creator. You'll also see a, um, some small tobacco ties they're made of small pieces of cloth and traditional tobacco is placed inside and tied with yarn or string. <clears throat> this is another way to pass or present traditional tobacco to one another when asking for prayers or guidance. There's a beaded tobacco pouch in which traditional tobacco is carried. And you'll also see a hand holding some of the traditional tobacco. And these are just some of the images that relate to the ways that Native Americans use and honor traditional tobacco. Next slide, please. This is my favorite. <laughs> so some of the traditional teachings are, are occurring right here at the Lac de Flambeau Public School. Educating young children about the sacred medicine is a form of prevention, showing them how to plant, water, nurture, and properly use traditional tobacco will help deter the use of commercial tobacco. Traditional tobacco is a medicine which can be used as a way to promote physical, spiritual, emotional, and community well-being. Combining these teachings, consistent communications, and messaging to youth is an important part of our prevention strategy. American Indian and Alaska Native youth have higher rates of commercial tobacco use than any other race. So since the revitalization of this process is fairly new, it might take some generations to see if there's a decline in the commercial tobacco use, and we hope our efforts prevail. Next slide, please. The tobacco industry has a well-documented history of targeting minority and marginalized populations, including American Indians and Alaska Natives. Targeted marketing and advertisements can be directly linked to tobacco use. Red man chewing tobacco has been targeting American Indians and Alaska Natives since 1901 by drawing the mystique of Indianness with an American Indian chief and Native American headdress images, for example. This imagery and symbolism was carried well into the 1950s and even today. Although tobacco has cultural significance, romanticized images of American Indians and Alaska Natives 
have been used for decades to market and sell commercial tobacco products in order to portray them as a natural and spiritual experience. These tactics not only misappropriated indigenous culture, but also reinforced harmful stereotypes of American Indians. Prominent tobacco company Natural American Spirit is a primary offender. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna elaborate a little bit on some of our collaborative successes that I've had with, with the state and coalition building and partnerships. <clears throat> it's not a comprehensive list of everything, but it showcases huge strides toward health equity. This is an acknowledgement of a foundation that we have built and continue to build upon. Acknowledging sovereignty is a very important one. We, have, we as tribes have our own unique relationship with the government and the state. It's like we are a state within the state. We have a government to government relationship. Relationship building can be difficult in Indian country. We've successfully developed work groups and had some powerful meetings to move our work forward by adding a cultural training and tailoring to fit our work. Everyone wins. It can't be a one and done. And so we have to keep it consistent. In building successful relationships, we're in the phases of making some policy changes. Our casino has gone smoke free since COVID. There are roughly 26 tribal casinos and two casinos are not smoke free yet. And I emphasize yet, <laughs> we're working on getting them on board and the goal is to have all of our tribal casinos in Wisconsin commercial tobacco free clack. This feeds into our engagements with our housing departments um, to help develop some smoke free housing policy too. It's a huge challenge, but I'm up for it. <laughs> Next slide, please. So in the last couple of years, we've really been promoting our American Indian quit line. So this quit line campaign is, is pretty new, but I've been really, really pushing this number. And um, when I came into this position, it was empty for eight months. And I also came in during COVID. So needless to say, it's been very, very challenging to navigate the program. But I built a Winatin network of seven tribes and we've gotten creative in our outreach methods. So our, this quit line has been like our biggest push. Uh, we've taken this flyer and in partnership um, with our local housing authority, they placed this flyer into all the bills that go out every month so that this um, phone number was getting into tribal homes. And we also implemented uh, some media outreach, radio, social media, um, radio ads, um, and strategic placement of these billboards on or near tribal um, reservation and tribal lands. And as of just like literally, as of just like two days ago, I had the American Indian quit line um, on the videos at our gas pumps at our store. So that took some effort, but yeah, so kudos for that. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I came up with a little bit of creative swag, if you want to call it. Um, American Indian Quit Line was placed on books of matches, and we offer them to natives when they purchase cigarettes at our local Ojibwe market. Uh, so here's a little kind of a success story. Um, my cousin said that there was a gentleman that came in and asked for um, a book of matches. And she's like, yeah, sure. So she gave him the matches, and he's looking at the book, and he's like, you know, this is my second book. I really should consider calling the number on here. I don't know if he called, but at least the message is getting out there. And we're really pushing and, and promoting that. Um, so the American Indian quit line is also on the back of those. They're like stress balls, but they're in the shape of lungs. So the quit line's on the back of those. And everyone's like, what's up with the little killer whale? Why, why do you have it on there? And I said, well, commercial tobacco is a killer. So we put the quit line on those as well. Um, so this is just some of the creative outreach that we've done uh, within Winnetton. Next slide. So some of the key takeaways, again, I uh, want to just talk about sovereignty, uh, understanding the historical trauma, uh, understanding that traditional tobacco is ours. Again, that was taken away. We're doing what we can to, to revitalize that. 
and it's a traditional sacred thing and we just ask that you please respect that one of the um key takeaways also is there should be nothing about us without us it's not the state's responsibility or anyone's responsibility to say you should do abc we need to be at the table to discuss a lot of those things we know what's best for us and nobody else so it's very very important to build that relationship and trust but again building trust does take time next slide please So the CDC did also uh, come up with some best practices user guide and again we'll try to provide that link at another time, which is I think it's a really this this is kind of hot off the press too, and I think it's a really, really good good resources a lot of. Um, a lot of things that we're already kind of doing are in there so it's kind of a really, really great guideline for for everybody. And next slide. So with that, I will say miigwech. Um, that means thank you in my language. Um, my email is there. And I just want to share that. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. I, I am in this space. I am here for you. I am here to help. Um, I, you know, it's kind of like I'm, I'm an open book. You know, I'm very, very approachable. I like to have, um, because I like to think of this as, you know, we're all in this space together. I think we all have the same kind of common goal and that's to kind of just help get rid of all the commercial tobacco so um we'll just leave this open for some questions comments discussion and i'll turn it back over to pat thank you thank you melissa i'm i'm applauding virtually and in <laughs> so i know that uh big webinars and zoom are a little different but thank you so much thank you for speaking truth Mm -hmm. Thank you for setting the stage about um, some of the his, historic trauma that's occurred and um, and your start your sharing of the stories very, very important so uh, I definitely want to thank you for that. Uh, I am going to thank you uh, it's a natural like transition to uh, a question that I, I put on kind of ready for a question so. I imagine there's people on the call that really don't have any contacts with tribes in their region mm -hmm. and they'd like to reach out and you know partner mm -hmm. and what would you recommend to to start making connection with tribal partners in your in the region um, that you're living or yeah well one of the things that i had discovered here was most of my wenatan reps they work in their tribal clinics so what i would do um, is, you know, to make one of those little small tobacco ties and you try to find somebody within that health clinic that works with cessation. And that's kind of your first approach to say, I want to bring you some tobacco so that we can collaborative, collaboratively work together. I can't tell you how powerful that is. And I will share that when I went over to a conference in Minneapolis, um, there was a lady in, one in, in the state with our coalition and partnerships she came and she brought tobacco to me she gave me a tobacco tie and said i want to learn more about your culture i want to understand more and i can't tell you how far that goes so it's um it's a really big sign of respect and that's kind of where i would start is possibly reaching out to your clinic finding out who you know people that work in the cessation and try to just develop some relationships that way with um just starting off with a a, a base meeting you know um just introductions and then you can kind of go from there great thank you for that i'm going to check that q a box again um how can ala staff approach tribal councils to, to share about prog programming we have to see if there's an interest in the programs within tribal nations um, for for our specific tribe, you have to go through our tribal um, secretary to request to be on the agenda. So you probably have to get a hold of, um, you know, because and all tribal councils are different. Ours have like 12 people. We have a, a chair, a vice, a secretary, treasurer, and then other members on there. Other tribes might only have seven, some have five, um, but it's important to, and you can probably get that off of 
Google, you know, if you Google their tribe and then you can start making some phone calls and just ask, how can I get on the agenda for the next council meeting? There's probably, a, and each, like, again, each tribe is very, very different. There's a process. Usually it's kind of two weeks prior, you have to have your request in and then like to even provide documentation or PowerPoint if you're trying to present and make sure that you take your tobacco with you. <laughs> To okay, you, you've you generated some like buzz in the chat. <laughs> we got buzz going on okay. uh, about bringing tobacco because, mm -hmm. you know, this is maybe for some folks just the first they've heard about this. And um, so question came up, can we bring tobacco as non-Indian people? I'd be absolutely. worried about appropriating. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to be honest, in, in today's world, even me we've used commercial tobacco as a form of mm -hmm. offering and again because that traditional stuff it was taken we don't we don't have that we're just now kind of building that back up so it is kind of common practice right now to use the commercial tobacco they come in the big bags and people would take a little bit out and offer that way if you put it in a tie it's it kind of masks that i think um, but the the um, the intent is there, and I think that that's more important than than trying to find the the traditional tobacco. So yeah. that's a that's a starting point. So what us non-Indian would say, it's the roll your own bag, so yeah. or piped pipe, <laughs> you know, yeah, the roll your own. Um, and, and what would you say if you're nervous about it? Like you're thinking, I want to do this. I'm not quite sure. I don't want to, you know, offend. Well, I want to do it from the heart that. and goodwill. Just okay. say that. Just say, okay. you know, I just recently had a culture training. Um, there's so much that I don't know and so much that I still want to learn. Mm -hmm. I was told to to offer tobacco in a good way. Is this is this okay to do? Ask them. Is is are you accepting of this? And just say, I'd like to learn more. And I don't think anyone's going to turn you away. I mean, I, like I said, that tobacco will go a long way. And just okay. that you're, you're trying to learn. You're trying to understand. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like my daughter would say, you've got two ears and one mouth. So <laughs> <laughs> you know that, kids. Um, so to better understand the culture, is there a certain age that young people start using tobacco, the ceremonial tobacco? Um, yeah, it's from the time they can walk and hold it. We have kids that will dig and take a little pinch of it and then offer it or put it in a pipe or put it on the ground. It's, it starts at a very, very young age. Great. Okay. Um, okay. So not just again, smoking. the question. I'm saying not, not smoking it. I'm talking no. about just offering it or having it in no. their, in their hand. Yeah. And I know you showed a pipe, but does any tribal person smoke a pipe? And can you do you smoke at any time? No, um, like I, I don't have one. Sometimes uh, you are gifted that from maybe an elder. We do have what we call like pipe carriers. Some people are pipe carriers. Um, but as long as you're using it in a in a good way, just to offer prayer. Um, yeah, like I said, but I don't have one, but there are pipe carriers. You know, something that came to mind too, because I was working with a co my co colleague in um, doing a parks policy, and we had some tribal partners with us in our coalition, and we really wanted to be sure that we didn't have an unintended consequence of not allowing. Oh, you frozen, Pat. Spiritual co as part of the policy. So the exception is in that policy for. Um, the appropriate use of, of non-commercial tobacco. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, same with carrying it in the schools. I believe that there are schools that have policies that an Indigenous person can carry their tobacco with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are there any oral or throat cancers associated with native use of traditional pipes? I do not know the answer to that. that I know. No. Yeah, I don't I don't even know don't if do. there would be there might be data on it, but then there's that data sovereignty thing and those are um, like HIPAA, mm -hmm. you know, can't really. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know the answers that and, and I don't yeah. know that I would be able to find the answer to that. Mm -hmm. So Christina, I think Hamilton, you wanted to, to jump in or maybe not. Nope. Nope. All right. All right. All right, good. Um, so I think we've covered most of the questions. We're gonna give one more shout out there for any questions. I know I was gonna ask one about data because that does get to be a lot of time we like to say, oh, can we do a survey? Do you wanna do a survey? But you, you know, you mentioned data, but maybe talk a little more about any approach around data. Um, you probably would definitely need to get permission before doing any kind of survey. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's that's. And what about releasing the data? What about releasing the data? That would be up to like each um, tribal council. Yeah, that's that's kind of a. Okay, is the time can be touchy. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I hear you there. Um, hold on just a second. I'm trying to find my. Okay. And Pat, while we wait for Melissa, there are two questions left in the Q and A. One is where would we find non-commercial tobacco to make a tobacco tie or pouch? And is there a Minnesota organization parallel to W and A T N? I'm, I'm not oh, sure. Where would you find non-commercial? Yeah. Um, that would just depend on your member. location, finding a tribe that may have some. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be a little bit of a process too, because you know, common practice again is um, just using the com the commercial tobacco in the bags to make ties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were gifted some by an elder from a tribe that we've shared, mm -hmm. um, and then acknowledged that the source was this elder. Uh, is there a parallel organization in Minnesota to Wanatan? I'm not positive, but um, I have a couple of friends that are in this group called um, Creating Connections. There is someone in, in Minnesota, her name is uh, Coco Villaluz. Um, so I'm going to reach out to her and, and ask yeah, that yeah. question, see what we can find out over there. Okay, yeah, Coco has a long, deep history in tobacco yeah. control uh, yeah. across the country, and yes, yes, good. And then you can also, um, uh, what is it? Um, is it Walking Towards the Sacred or Keep It Sacred, um, which is like from the National Native Network? There's some resources on there as well that um, that you can find. I'll Great. Well, I. I do want to thank Melissa again. As you can see, she is very, um, she comes to this with a learning and serving uh, person as, you know, ask the question, you do it from the heart, and we're in this to learn together and um, to again make the future better uh, for all our children. Uh, when we work together, we're much more effective when we understand the history. Uh, that also brings us a different level of, of um, relationship building. And I love that you said it takes time <laughs> mm -hmm. and you hope the person stays that you can you know, make that connection. But um, definitely Melissa offered, if you wanna reach out to her, mm -hmm. uh, she's very well connected and uh, I think we'll make a good faith effort to help get you to the person or persons or uh, okay. provide an answer to you. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining and take care everyone. Uh, stay safe, Melissa, in the snow and- uh, It's coming down. Yes, it's coming down. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.